Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Genius Lounge. Today on the show we have Hasina Mumtaz who is the advisor to Ken Livingstone followed by Boris Johnson. Assalamu alaikum. and assalamu alaikum to your viewers as well. How are you today? Alhamdulillah, I'm very well. Thank you for coming over to interview me. Thank you for having us. Um, you used to be the advisor to yes. Ken Livingstone. Yes. How did that come about? Was um, that your first job or? No, I had been working as a, a communications advisor at Lambeth Council and it was actually Ken that inspired me to go mm -hmm. into politics. I remember watching his speech, I was quite young at the time, uh, when the GRC was disbanded and he spoke very emotionally yeah. and um, you know, I sort of forgot about it, went on to university, um, I graduated from the London School of Economics. Yeah. Uh, some time after I graduated, the GLA came about and there was an advert for a job and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I have to go yeah. for this. But I felt, I can't Was that the advisor's job? Um, it, no, it was actually the press assistant's job. Oh, okay. Um, and I thought, I have to go for this. But anyway, it, it ended up that they, they didn't recruit for that role. Mm. And then that's when the advisory role came up and it was as a media relations advisor in the press team. And I thought, I couldn't possibly apply yeah. for this, I don't have the skills. But actually somebody very inspirational encouraged me and said, you really need, you know, you should go for it, you have to push yourself. And I did, and it was actually a very gruelling selection process yeah. because there was a written test, an exam, um, followed by a series of interviews. And it, it was a bit like The Apprentice where each round, you know, somebody's knocked out and you, you uh. proceed further. And eventually I, I ended up with the role. Yeah. Um, so you can imagine how, how chuffed and pleased I was about that. Um, but also very daunted at the prospect of this huge role. I know. So after working with Ken Livingstone, Boris Johnson came into the scene, wasn't it? And that was during the time you were working. Yes. What was it like? Because Ken is your typical, the man on the left, and then you've got mm. Boris Johnson further to the right. So for you as an advisor, your advice had to be different. It wasn't the mm. same thing. How did you... How did, you, how did you deal with that? Well, I advised Ken for five years, from 2003 mm. to 2008, and then Boris was elected in 2008. And it was actually, it was a very, very, it had, the year leading up to the election had been mm. a very, very stressful time. Yeah. And I was there um, during the London bombings. So we were used to working at extremely high levels of mm. pressure. Um, and then Boris came in and, and the pressure sort of increased because you feel, right, I'm starting again from the beginning. Yeah. One of the most important things in politics is trust and building up relationships. Mm -hmm. So over those five years, I had built up that relationship, not just with Ken himself, yeah. but also with his um, political advisors. So here we are again, and it's ideologically, you know, some Boris and Ken come from ideologically course, very different backgrounds. Different. Yeah. Um, but also as, as personalities, they were both very different. So it was starting that process again of getting to know Boris, winning his trust, winning his confidence. Was it more difficult? Because Ken has been seen as the, what well, the campaign at that time was the mayor for the Muslims, mm -hmm. and then he didn't get in, and you being a Muslim woman, becoming the advisor to Boris, how was that taken? I wouldn't describe it as more difficult, but mm -hmm. um, there were different challenges, yes. and that's how I'd put it. Um, one of the things that ha had happened in the lead up during the election campaign, I know there were a lot of um, organisations that were campaigning against Boris and were saying, you know, he's not going to be good for, for the Muslim community. Um, so I think that made me realise actually, because I have a lot of contacts yeah. in the Muslim communities, this is where I can help to build that bridge between the mayor's office, between Boris and some of these organisations and bring my sort of specialist skills to bear. So one of the things I encouraged Boris to do, it was uh, Ramadan, I think, about three mm -hmm. months after Boris was elected. And I advised that Ramadan is coming up. Uh, I think we should do this, this and this, and this will be how we can engage and start building When you say stages. this, this, um, for example, what kind of stuff? Well, uh, first of all, I said we should organise a visit to a masjid mm -hmm. uh, during Ramadan. I think you need to go and, sh you know, get your face out yeah. there and, and, and allay some of those fears that people have about you and actually that went down amazingly well it mm. it was scary so many people turned up there were about 200 people yeah. i was standing there with boris and about 200 people rushed us this was at the lmc and it was amazing the response was very positive and he spoke and after that actually the job became much easier because people had this perception mm -hmm. 
Um, but he showed that he was willing to engage with um, communities across the board. Who were you more comfortable working with? I know they've both got their own style of working and mm. everyone's got their own different personality. Mm. Who was more easy and to work with? I mean, as I say, they were different personalities. Mm. Um, the, the immediately noticeable thing was with some of the policies. The policies changed yeah. very quickly. The other thing that changed quite quickly is the, the, the media that we were targeting. So mm -hmm. previously where we would go to um, some of the more, say The Guardian, yeah. we were now starting to engage with the editors from The Times and The Telegraph and things like that. So that was one thing. The other thing, Boris, um, and I know you want to know about their personalities, but this mm. is a sort of context of it. The other thing that Boris wanted to make a big change in, he wanted obviously bringing the sort of conservative yeah. ideology. He wanted some of the events and some of the things that we were doing, like the, the Londoner newspaper to become, mm -hmm. well, he got rid of the Londoner, but some of the community events, he wanted them to become self-financing. So we had, um, the sponsorship team had to go out and get more sponsorship. The marketing team was, was got rid of. So that put a huge amount of pressure on us, the press team, to get more coverage with fewer resources. Um, but in terms of their personalities, both of them, um, mm. I, you know, at the end of the day, they're human beings like yeah. everybody else and you have to connect with them on a human level. With Ken, because he he was already mayor for three years before I had joined, so he was quite, you know, very yeah. settled into the role uh, and I went in and started advising him. When Boris came in for the first six months, he depended on us to tell him because we had been there for years and it was all new to him. Um, he was very receptive. Mm -hmm. um, he really took our advice on board. Um, and he settled into the role and, you know, it was a transition for him yeah. as much as for us. And during the first, I would say, two or three months, it was really um, a lot of changes, a lot of, it was a very kind of transitory period. There were a lot of advisors, you know, you'd be dealing with yeah, one advisor course. one day from uh, Tory Central Office because Boris still had to appoint his yeah. team. The next day you'd go, it was a different advisor. And you think, ah, oh, I've just spent two weeks building up the sort of relationship where I can get them. How did they take advice from you being a female and um, being from an ethnic back background? Did that, did that make any difference or they actually perceived you as someone who has that much knowledge to pass mm. on? I don't feel that being a female was sort of did it make uh, no difference? a factor in anything. But I think uh, with Boris, um, with me coming from a, a Muslim background, as I say, um, I was a good sounding board for mm -hmm. him in terms of what's happening with Muslim communities, a, a good kind of feedback mechanism. So I could feedback what he was doing to Muslim communities and uh, and vice versa. Um, so that actually How helped me. How did the me. community perceive you as working with Boris? Um, how were they towards you? Were they different from the Ken's time or were they, they it didn't really bother him? Well, I mean, I think with, with all politicians, they have their detractors and they have their supporters. Mm -hmm. So there were people that didn't like Ken. Yeah, um, and, and they would be quite critical. Um, and then there were people that were very supportive of Ken. So in that respect, it didn't change much. But I think it did, with Boris coming in, it did take a bit of winning over, mm -hmm. which is something I was happy to, you know, I was in a privileged position to be able to create my own niche okay. there. And that helped me actually to work more closely with Boris and to win his trust as well. So eventually you moved over from City Hall to mm. something more different. Yes, um, so I was offered a massive promotion as Deputy Head of News and Media for the Local mm -hmm. Government Association, okay. which is based in Westminster and it's a membership body for 400 or so local authorities across England and Wales. So the key change there was a um, I became a senior manager on the senior management board and had my own team to mm -hmm. run. And also it, it took me from a regional stage to a national stage. So I had to advise uh, the chairman and a new chief executive who had come in. So helped to set the strategic direction. There, were, there was an election, so there were newly elected members who were looking to me to provide advice for them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you have a team, so there's the day-to-day operational running of a huge media yeah, team with a massive brief and we worked very closely with central government with um, CLG with Eric Pickles's department so there's 
that relationship with central government to manage as well, as well as the media, as well as, you know, your own team, as well as other people within the organisation that we work very closely with, such as the public affairs team, you know. Um, so it was a really multifaceted, really, um, it, it was a huge, huge responsibility. You've had some great achievements, haven't you? Thank you. Well, you know, I I mean, that. for a Muslim woman and a Bangladeshi woman to be in such a high profile job, it must have been easy for you. You had other supports to help you achieve what you've done, as in family support? My family have always been supportive, mm -hmm. um, but I'm sort of used to Chinese. I mean, I come from a very humble background, yeah. and the, the, when I attended the LSC, it was a huge challenge. It was such a change in environment and the sorts of people that I was meeting, but it actually laid the foundation. Today, everyone goes to university. Yeah. It's part of what you do after school, college, you go uni. Yeah. But those days, it wasn't, was it? It was like a big str struggle, because I do recall those days, girls used to get married young, yes. and used to start their own family, but yours is completely different. You went to university, had your own career. How was that perceived? It was, I mean, my father actually was always very encouraging. He always mm -hmm. wanted his children to be educated. Um, so my father encouraged me a lot, but there was a point sort of after college, there's pressure from yeah. other members of the family, you know, it's time to get her married off. If she's not married by 20, she'll be left on the shelf and all of that kind of stuff. Past herself by day yes, and the exactly. usual, yeah, of course. Exactly. And, you know, it was a long time ago when I think attitudes were quite different in our community. And alhamdulillah, they are changing. Um, so, but he was very proud when I when I got mm -hmm. into LSE and he managed to allay the fears of other members of the family. Um, so I think my dad actually did encourage me very much. And um, I, I had always been academic. I, I was a bit of a, a bookworm, I was a bit of a geek at school. Yeah. And um, so I kind of followed the straight O levels, A levels, university. Mm -hmm. It was something I wanted as an achievement, but also I just didn't want that academic learning to stop yeah. because I loved learning. Yeah. Um, you know, I think learning and seeking knowledge never stops. Of course. Um, so it was alhamdulillah, it was good that I had the support of my father and he understood that it's as important for women to educate themselves mm -hmm. as it is for the men because I think it tends to be that the brothers in the family are encouraged and the daughters are less so. Back, know, back in those days, I think it's changed it's now. It's quite sad because um, Islamic, they do, they do say if you mm -hmm. educate a man, you educate a man, but if you educate a woman, you educate it's a nation. nation yes. And you're the wife of the house sort of looks after the kids and the first that we our kids get from is the mother. You mentioned mm -hmm. about Islam. I mean, in, we have the best female role models in Islam. If you look at people like the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu you know, and some of the women of the Sahaba, you know, the, the first martyr in Islam was a woman. You know, so if we, and I think that's, it's, you know, and it's one of those things where cultural kind of ideologies tend to overtake what the Islamic teaching should be. I know for you, Islam came quite later stage in life, and that was due to a great loss. Mm. Islam was always the foundation of mm -hmm. my life. Um, it, my family were very conservative, yeah. and we were brought up, and you, you probably went through this yourself when you're young, you know, you read the Quran, but you read it in Arabic, and you yeah. don't know what you're reading, and you don't connect with it. Um, and then, you know, you're busy with your education and work, and all of these, and family life, you know, happens, and things, you know. So I um, got married, and after marriage, alhamdulillah, I had a son, and he actually died, he returned back to Allah, last year, in June 2014, he was mm -hmm. killed in a road traffic collision with an uninsured driver. Uh, and after that, obviously, you can imagine the shock. I yeah, actually course. stopped working. Um, he was your only child? He was my only child, and he, he had just turned 18 a few days before. He was, alhamdulillah, an incredible child. He was studying for his accountancy and a degree. He was also... Um, working part-time and he also set up a business at the age of 17. Mm -hmm. That's what he was doing for the last six months of his life. He was working during the day, in the evening working part-time, setting up the restaurant business and studying accountancy. Sure. And he never missed his Jumma prayers, alhamdulillah. So Islam was always there as the foundation for our lives. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't practicing at that time, I wasn't wearing hijab. And you know, I had a very busy lifestyle, very pressured environment. I worked in a 24-hour press office where we'd get calls at three in the morning. Yeah. You're available 24 hours a day, every day, you know, of the year. So it was a very, very stressful environment. And it, it was tough, you know, bringing up a child 
uh, managing those responsibilities. But last year, I stopped working after he died. And since then, I've actually been campaigning for justice for mm -hmm. him. Because as I say, the driver who killed him was uninsured. And the CPS have decided not to prosecute him for various reasons. Although he has a previous conviction yeah. from 2011, did they say insurance. why they weren't going to prosecute him? Because he killed a person, that in itself. It's, it's, it's to do with a complicated legal ruling. It was, mm -hmm. you know, um, court cases, they set precedents for things that you can do. There's, so there's that court ruling where the threshold for um, sort of responsibility changed. It's, it's become actually very difficult. Yeah. I've also become involved with an organisation called Road Peace and they've told me there were a spate of um, cases that mm -hmm. were taken to court and they all lost and after that the CPS have decided, you know, with budget you know, restraints and resources, lack of resources, they're just not prosecuting. So there's political... How did you deal with that as a mother? Because you're also a single mum, aren't you? Um, yes, um, so I've been bringing up some of my own since he was about 11, but as I say, he was an incredible person. As much as I was a source of support for him, he was a source of support for me, mm -hmm. because he was so independent, he was so bright um, and, and reliable and, and, you know, humbly a, a smart boy. So yes, it, it did present its challenges because I couldn't give him as much time as I would have wanted to do. Yeah. Um, but we had a very, very strong relationship. Um, of so, so you know, since he's passed away, I've been campaigning, as I say, to get justice. I've been working with my MP mm -hmm. um, and with Road Peace and, and some other bodies um, to try and get justice for him. I've done a media campaign about what's happened, and, and there's a few other things that will be happening, yeah. inshallah, in future. So, how did you deal with come. your loss? You know. <sighs> To this day, the most emotional moment for me is the police came to the house and I was alone yeah. at home and they said, we think you need to sit down, we've got something to tell you. Um, and when they broke the news to me, I, I was shocked. I was in a state of shock. I just could not believe it. And sometimes, you know, even now, I think... I'm going to come home and he's going to be here yeah. waiting for me. It's so hard to accept, of course. especially because he was, you know, so full of life, you know, and being my only child, I think I'm still going through that state of grieving. You know, there, there's so many stages within 10 minutes, I can mm. have 10 different emotions from grief to anger to fear, you know, all these emotions run through my head, but Alhamdulillah, what has really helped me is coming back to, to the Deen and to returning back to Allah. For the last year, I've been um, studying at the Taliban Institute, mm -hmm. and that's helped, obviously, to, for me to increase in my knowledge, to increase in my Iman, and it gives me hope. I think that's the biggest thing for us as Muslims, is that we have that hope that we will well, see our loved ones again in a better place, inshallah. Suppose they do say Allah doesn't burden you with more than what you can handle and Absolutely. he knows you could handle this and you're Absolutely. strong enough. And I suppose this dunya is a test for us yes. and the fact it is reassuring that we can reunite again. Yes, and as you say, as well as being a test, it makes you realise how temporary this dunya is. And actually, you know, as you know probably from the hadith, this world is just a bridge to mm. our real life. Um, and that, that's another thing. It makes you realise while I'm here, I'm being tested. We'll all be tested. Everybody has their trials and tribulations. It's not just me. And there is a hadith that says, don't look at your problems. Look at the person yeah. who's worse off. And that gives you patience. That gives you sabr. You know, and, and it, it, it gives you that hope as well, as I say. So what are you doing these days? I mean, I know you had your high profile lifestyle mm. where you were working 24 hours and then your life changed. Mm. Yeah. However, at the same time, you have to move on. Yeah. You have to move on with your life. Um, at this moment, what are you doing with yourself? Well, Alhamdulillah, people say that I'm very strong and uh, I am because, uh, you know, I think when you connect to our light, it does strengthen mm -hmm. you and it does strengthen your mind. But you know, um, I took a few months off because literally, yeah. I was in a vacuum for a few months, just in a constant state of, of grieving. Course. And then I was approached by a charity called Children Plus, and they asked me to do some consultancy for them. So I did that. I worked on a project for a few months, and that helped me sort of um, to get back in, into. And it made me realise how much 
I child loved plus, PR. Is that Masru- Ajwa Masrur's? It is PR. charity, yes. So and, you were working with him closely? Um, I worked with the chief executive of mm-hmm. the charity and um, and did a project for them which, you know, got onto BBC News. So it was, you know, great publicity for them and also it gave me some of my yeah. confidence back as well that, you know, I can still do this and I can get over this. Um, but the one thing that's changed is my perspective. I, I don't see everything in terms of, I suppose, the dunya, you know, yeah. and I think... What am I doing to build for my akhirah? Because Sami left the house. He said, I'll be back in five minutes. And the next time I saw him was in the mortuary. And it makes you realize, actually, you know, we do so many things and we get distracted. But we need to focus. Allah doesn't say, don't do this and don't achieve. And, you know, but at the same time, we need to focus on akhirah as well. So everything I do, that guides me. Mm-hmm in terms of everything I do. So that's why I wanted to do some work for the charity. Um, I did that and I delivered that project and then I was approached to um, edit a newspaper. Mm-hmm. So I was editor-in-chief for a newspaper for some time. And Which I still, newspaper was this again? It's the Asian Sunday, so okay. it's a national title and it's, it's across the board, all Asian mm-hmm. communities and, and non-Muslims and non-Asians as well. Um, so I did that. And I'm still the po- sort of political editor, advisor okay. editor there, and I still write freelance articles. Um, I am approached as a, as a public speaker all the time, so I'm speaking at various events, one of which is the World Memorial Day for uh, victims of road traffic crashes, and I'm, I've been nominated by Road Peace as their speaker, so there's a yeah. massive event on Sunday with all the borough leaders and MPs and, you know, the emergency services, so I'm nervous, but I'm going to speaking. Of course, you're right, lazy. Well, it's only normal. I don't know that, alhamdulillah. But it's, it's, it's another way of me getting yeah. my son's story out. And in terms of our community, because I know you were interested in, in you know, how this sort of resonates with our community, I, I think, alhamdulillah, Allah has made us women quite strong. Mm-hmm. And I don't think you have to think in those terms anymore, that if, that if I have a family, then having a career, these two things are mutually exclusive. They're not no matter what trials you go through, in a way, having those things as a distraction has helped me to become stronger and get back into the swing of life or whatever you, however you might want to phrase it. So I don't think for us women or people in Muslim communities, I don't feel that any doors are closed to us. Mm-hmm. You know, it, I think to date, I've been the most senior Bangladeshi at City Hall. If you were to advise someone who wanted mm-hmm. to follow your footstep, what would you advise them? I would say the key words here are tenacity and perseverance. If you really want something, do not give up on it. You know, keep going, keep going. If you can't get in through this route, look for other avenues. We all have contacts, you know, other ways that we can achieve the same thing. So don't always think outside the box. Mm-hmm. Um, the other two things I would say is, um, one thing, I think we have to be kinder to ourselves. I think we have to have more confidence in ourselves and we have to be a little bit more um, in terms of what we want. We have, you know, us women as Bangladeshi women, we always put our families and other people first. And I think we can do that and we should do that. But sometimes, you know, we we have to think about our own dreams and ambitions. And I think it is possible to achieve everything. And what would you like to say to other mothers who probably have lost their child in the process? Is there something that you'd like to share with them? Um, I mean, that's a bit, that's probably the hardest question, actually, because, you know, we all have, it's the worst thing, if I'm honest, I'm sitting here and I'm talking about all these other things and being strong, but it's the worst thing, it's, it's the worst thing that could ever happen to a mother is to lose their child because it's it just goes against the natural order you know I remember having a conversation with Sammy a month before and saying look if I die this is how I, you're, you're yeah. the one who's going to have to deal with it so this is how I want my, my funeral to be this is what I, how I want you to yeah. distribute my assets and you know and then a month later it was me burying him I really don't know what I can say except to say you know, have faith in Allah that whatever he does is from his perfect wisdom and it's from his knowledge. And have faith that Allah always hears the du'as of a mother. You know, so make abundant du'a for your child because that will help your child. Give sadaqah, that will help your child, but it also helps you to heal as well. Well, thank you so much for today. You're welcome.
you definitely are inspiring and it isn't easy with what you've lost and you've also picked up the pieces and carried on and I'm sure at a certain point you're still low and you still haven't moved on from one aspect of your life but however you have with your career aspect um, I wouldn't know what I would do if I was in her situation but alhamdulillah she's a very strong person and the advice I should like to give all of you is love yourself have self-confidence and think outside the box because we could all do a lot with ourselves take care assalamualaikum